So, yeah. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Jasoda Rohin Bhyam Ta. Yasoda Rohin Bhyam Ta. Sama Balasya Sarvataha Raksam Vida Dere Samyag Go Pucha Brahmana Dibihi Yasoda Rahi Bhyamta Sama Balasya Sarvataha Raksam Vida Dere Sam Yag Go Pucha Brahma Nadi Bihi Jasura Roni Bhyamta Sama Balasya Sarvataha Raksam Vida Dere Sam Yag Go Pucha Brahma Nadi Bihi Not puja, puja, puja. It's not puja. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Yasoda Rohini Vyam with Mother Yasoda and Mother Rohini who principally took charge of the child. Ta, the other gopis, Samam, equally as important as Yasoda and Rohini. Balasya of the child Sarvataha, from all dangers, Raksham, 
protection, vidadare, executed, samyak, completely, gopucha brahmanat adibihi, by waving around the switch of a cow. Okay, so now after Putana has been killed and the child is now safely in the arms of his two loving mothers, we continue. Thereafter, Mother Yasoda and Rohini, along with other elderly gopis, waved about the switch of a cow to give full protection to the child Sri Krishna. Purport, when Krishna was saved from the great danger, Mother Yasoda and Rohini were principally concerned, and the other elderly gopis, who were also equally concerned, followed the activities of Mother Yasoda and Rohini. Here, we find that in household affairs, ladies could take charge of protecting a child simply by taking help from the cow. As described here, they knew how to wave about the switch of a cow so as to protect the child from all types of dangers. There are many facilities afforded by cow protection, but people have forgotten these arts. The importance of protecting cows is therefore stressed by Krishna and Bhagavad Gita. Krishi go raksha radhi jam vaishna karma svabhava jam. Even now, in the Indian villages surrounding Vrindavan, the villagers live happily simply by giving protection to the cow. They keep cow dung very carefully and dry it to use as fuel. They keep a sufficient stock of grains, and because of giving protection to the cows, they have sufficient milk and milk products to solve all economic problems. Simply by giving protection to the cow, the villagers live so peacefully, even the urine and stool of cows have medicinal value. Om Agyan Timirandasya Gyanajana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Vadaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gorvani Pacharine Nirvasesa Sunyavari Pastyatya De Satarine Vanchakalpa Tirubhischa Kripa Sindhu Pevacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Sivasiri Gaur Vaktarin Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare hmm. So we're hearing a little bit about the glory and benefit of keeping and protecting cows. And so nowadays they've traded cow dung, which is medicinal and can be used for so many uh, things that are needed, such as cooking and uh, medicine, also for fuel. They traded cow dung for dog dung, <laughs> or dog stool. <laughs> and cow dung is medicinal, and dog stool has da dysentery in it. <laughs> so. Hare Krishna, we made advancement. <laughs> We're moving forward. It's the dog race. <laughs> so uh, we see how, what is actual culture, what is actual uh, uh, understanding of the gifts that God has automatically given to the human society and how to take advantage of those gifts. And one of them is the, is the cow. Uh, recently when I was uh, traveling in America, uh, I was speaking in different venues about cows and agriculture, cow protection. And uh, in two different occasions, uh, one person responded after living in India for a while. He, he had grown up in the villages and they had cows there. And he was saying that, he said, it's interesting. He said that when someone in the family who has the cow, that's the family cow. And the cow, and that person, someone in that family gets sick, 
someone else will go to the cow and whisper in the cow's ear that this particular family member has this disease. And then the cow will automatically go out and start grazing around looking for a particular herb that it will cure that disease. <laughs> and then they'll eat that herb and then they milk that cow, they give that milk to that person and it cures their disease, at least it reduces it. <laughs> so here's an example that something that's hardly even known to uh, human culture that he, just by keeping a cow, it's like almost like having a doctor <laughs> right at home. And uh, so I had mentioned that statement in another venue after I was, I was speaking. And one, another gentleman who also had an experience in the village with cows, he said, it's not like that, Maharaj. He says, you don't even have to go and talk to the cow. The cow knows someone in the family is sick. <laughs> She has, she can sense it. And then she goes and then she eats that herb. <laughs> so, uh, quite amazing when you see how God has arranged for the upkeep of human society in a very easy and simple and natural way. And so cows, I mean, of course, we see how much emphasis is given in, in Vedic culture and in Krishna conscious practice to cows, the, it says that all of the demigods exist within the body of the cow. <laughs> the cow is really auspicious, and it's so auspicious that it is considered to be even more detrimental for a human being to kill a cow than they are to kill a human being. And the Madhu Samhita says that if you kill a cow, it's equal to killing two men. <laughs> so uh, we've lost that connection due to this uh, Western materialistic culture. And now instead of caring for cows or even allowing cows to live out their life, they kill cows. And this is all the problems in the world. And Prabhupada has made that statement quite often. He didn't say these are some of the problems. He said it all stems from the slaughtering of these innocent animals which are so beneficial to human society. And as individuals, they are very, um, once you get their confidence, of course, sometimes cows, you know, they have to get to know you first before they get to really relate to you. Once they get to know you, they're very affectionate, very, very affectionate. And so, uh, and they're almost, you know, they are, we see so many pictures of Krishna's with cows. Krishna's Gopal, <laughs> he's Govinda. He, he takes care of cows, he associates with cows, and he, he the many of his uh, pictures that are here, we see very affectionate to the cows. <laughs> and in the uh, Bhagavatam, it explains that society is required to give protection to five categories of people, and without doing that, those who are in charge, who have some facility to give protection to others, such as parents or leaders or people who have certain positions in the social order, if they don't do that, they are guilty of uh, neglect, and therefore they, they actually become offensive. And the five kind of people, five types of people, or five categories, you could say, are women, children, Old people, those who can who will require some care after a certain age, um, cows and brahmanas. And then it goes on in in the purport describing that verse. It says that out of the five, two are given special attention, and that's the cows and the brahmanas. Because with brahminical culture, cow protection flourishes. Without Brahminical culture, there's no question of cow protection. You have Rakshasya culture right now, and therefore nobody's protected. <laughs> you have to protect yourself. It's like in America, it's a highly armed country. Everybody has weapons, even the students, <laughs> they bring them to school. <laughs> It's a highly armed country, there's, there's no gun, there are gun laws, but it's very loosely applied. 
and people are protecting themselves, but and to say they at least they claim to be, but it's more like the Wild West. <laughs> Very dangerous. I remember when I was on Sankirtan, twice, three times actually, twice by individuals and once by police. They pulled a gun on me. <laughs> Just approaching a person at their vehicle, they got a little nervous, pulled their, went into their glove compartment, and there was a revolver looking at me. <laughs> so I stopped, of course, and started chanting. Um, obviously, nothing happened. <laughs> or else I would be another person giving class today. <laughs> but the point is that it was, you know, so uh, yeah, there is no protection for people, and so people are trying to protect themselves by uh, exacerbating the problems by more and more violence within society. So, so it's a quite of a disruptive and very uh, dysfunctional society. Everything is based on economic development and sense gratification. But here we go back uh, to um, just like I spent much time in Nuvrindavan, we had we had a lot of cows in Nuvrindavan. We had a, quite a large goshala, and uh, at one point we had 550 cows, which was obviously at one point we understood it was too many cows. <laughs> but we were milking the cows and selling the milk to the local dairies, and then it, and of course. We would try in some way to offer it before, so they would be. But people were buying prashad of milk, so we thought that would be a good idea to spread the mercy through prashad. But after some time, it became too much of a burden to keep 550 cows, and, and you have to figure out what to do with the cows, and then that becomes a problem. <laughs> and so that was another problem. But anyway. Um, so we spend a lot of time with the cows, and um, we would go every day in the morning right after the Bhagavatam class. The whole class would go out and go to the barn, and then we would be given combs, these little like hard wire brush combs, and we would be combing the cows and petting the cows and just meeting the cows and sometimes feeding the cows. We'd give them some, you know, these uh, big, uh, what they call it, uh, it's like, like popcorn and gore together, <laughs> big balls. You know? And before you could even get close to them, they would be grabbing it. <laughs> they loved them. We'd give them bananas. One time we gave them chapatis. <laughs> so they liked it. So it was it was a, a nice mood having the cows there, and uh, it really created a nice aesthetic environment just being around the cows, like that. And of course, we always had plenty of milk, so we were making nice milk sweets for the deities. And Nuvrindavan at that time became quite famous for its milk sweets. And Srila Prabhupada, would, when he would come, he would always say. Yes, I want some of those Nuvindavan milk sweets. <laughs> he would ask for them, not even, we would, even before we would give it to him. So yeah, it was a, just a very simple, but a very w a nice way to, uh, to uh, perform devotional service in association with cows. <laughs> and of course, the bulls also, we were doing a little plowing in the fields with the bulls and also but that was always difficult because bulls, you only need so many bulls. <laughs> but it's a small problem compared to the society which has pushed out the Vedic culture and has replaced it with this uh, Rakshasha culture, <laughs> which is based on destruction of the human sentiments and exploitation of everybody. Even the people who are exploiting, they're exploiting them themselves. So here we find a very simple lifestyle. And uh, Srila Prabhupada emphasized this very much in his last days before he left in 1977. He spoke a lot about the importance of developing farm communities and living more of a simplified life based on the cow and agriculture. 
He said, grow your own food. He said, whatever food you grow on your own farms, and there's 100 more nutritious than the foods you buy in the stores. And even now, we hear, and of course, we may, we may be able to experience to some degree, how laced with paste, pesticides and so many other herbicides and so many other f uh, forms of things that settle into your tissues and then after some time, maybe years later, you're diagnosed with cancer. People say, oh, you can't connect it, but it's actually there. So people are actually slowly dying by eating this food. <laughs> And just, um, therefore, Prabhupada, he, he could understand that the society would gradually go down and become more and more of a Dirakshasha society, and therefore we needed more of a self-sufficient lifestyle and less dependent on the, on the social, political, and economic arrangements by this Western, so-called Western culture. And therefore, he said, get these farms. <laughs> and then... Uh, he said, and, he, and of course, he said, milk. I remember when we were in New Vrindavan, we, would, we had so much milk. <laughs> and every night, the evening meal was milk and popcorn. <laughs> we would look forward to it. Big hot bowls of hot, steaming milk, half of it was cream and the other half was the milk. It was so thick. <laughs> And rich, we didn't, you didn't have to put any sweetener in it. It was already sweet. It was actually fragrant also. It was parmaganda. <laughs> and we'd, we'd get these big bowls and we'd have our popcorn. I don't know how much milk and popcorn go together, but, <laughs> you know, we never thought of it that in those days. Anyway, we just did it. <laughs> because we had no money and popcorn was cheap, so... <laughs> But devotees at one point were drinking quite a lot of milk. And uh, after some time, the devotees got sick. <laughs> and uh, Prabhupada, I mean, I mean, it seemed to all have happened at once, and many devotees were getting sick from drinking too much milk. And Prabhupada had just come right after that, and he said, this is the problem, Jai si pancha tattva ki jai. He said, you're drinking too much milk. And then he gave a formula. He said, no more than one pound, uh, which is, I don't know, I really can't translate it into millimeters or millimeters or grams or milligrams. But one pound and no, no less than one half pound per day. And he included that in all milk products, he said. So a pound is 17.2 ounces. And so half of that... And he said, and then he said, milk should be taken in, in, you know, meager quantities and not in large quantities, and you can live healthy. So you see, and now people protest, but got the idea of milk, they say milk is unhealthy. <laughs> the problem is, is that when you exploit the cow, the cow's going to react, and she's going to get back at you. <laughs> So when they keep cows for slaughter, and then they try to rape the cow by getting as much milk as they can in such a short span of life, the cows last only five years. The cow is fearful, and when she gives her milk, she, does, she adds this hormone that comes from the, the adrenaline of the cow, and it, it pollutes the milk. And when people drink it, it it's not very really healthy for them, actually. So they, and then they actually complain that milk is unhealthy. But it's because they're killing cows, they're getting a reaction for that. But when the cows are nice and kept and they're happy, as Prabhupada said, jubilant. <laughs> Use that word all the time. Cows, when the cows are jubilant, <laughs> they're fatty milk bags, they run along the fields, and when they, their milk bags are so fatty, that it sprinkles milk on the fields and it nourishes the fields and the fields become muddy. And then, uh, then there's no, then the milk is, it's like, it's medicine. <laughs> it's like medicine. So, uh, yeah, so that's when, so Prabhupada really emphasizes, he said, for every city temple, he should have one farm 
connected with that temple. And then he said that we should um, keep the farm, make, and grow vegetables and, and milk, and then bring it into our city temples, open up restaurants, and then give people this really nice prashada made from uh, the food from our, the milk and the vegetables from our farms. And he said, it will be so tasty, they will want to come back for more. <laughs> yeah, so Prabhupada had a whole scheme for a more or less the social environment for our society. And he emphasized that and the importance of a more simplified lifestyle, but depending more on Krishna's plan for the human society and not in, in mills and factories and various types of Ugra karma programs and which saps the energy of everybody. People go to work, at the end of the day they come back, they're so tired, they can't do anything but sleep and eat and then that's it. <laughs> so yeah, we live in a very dysfunctional society, what to speak about. Um, you know, actually practicing Krishna consciousness in a more natural way. Of course, you can practice Krishna consciousness anywhere because Krishna consciousness is not dependent on any material situation. But there are, there are facilities that are more conducive to the execution of Krishna consciousness. And a more simplified lifestyle allows for that environment to be more purified. It's like when you walk into a place that is sinful or it's been used for a sinful activity, you can feel that the energy is also of that nature. It becomes heavy. Uh, you walk into it, you, 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 if you walk into that bar on the street down the corner there, and then you come into the temple, you'll feel a big difference. You don't even have to speak or do anything. Because the atmosphere and spirituality is light. It brings you up, and the material energy, because those sinful activities actually get fixed into the into the ozone, and it becomes heavy, <laughs> and you feel a little bit pressured, distressed. That's for those who are sensitive. After a while, when people in, who, who frequent that quite often, they think it's normal, <laughs> because it's just like. The, Prabhupada used to say, yeah, when you walk into a room and it's a mess and you can't, and you see it, it's okay, and you walk out, that means you're of the same consciousness as the room. <laughs> so if you have a, a consciousness in the mode of ignorance and you walk into a place of the mode of ignorance, it looks normal. <laughs> but devotees are different. So, but a more natural lifestyle is also, should be available and devotees should think in how to maybe move in that direction as a more a future for sta stabilizing our lifestyle, especially for grihastas who have to send their children to public schools, and that means they, they're exposed. I was so when I was in America. This was a couple of years ago. One Indian family I was staying with, a young boy there. He was 14 years old. He was going to his high school there. And I was asking him, what is it like in the high school? He said, it's all, it's hell, he said. <laughs> he, said he said, some of the, my, uh, the other students, many of them, they go into the bathrooms and they unscrew the sinks and the toilets and take them home. <laughs> they steal the, the, the sinks and the toilets from the bathrooms. <laughs> Yeah, he wasn't. He was. He, he wasn't. You know, making it up. It was his mother was actually confirming it too. So, yeah. So this is. Uh, you know, we've really created a really. And if you send nice children to these schools, just like um, when I was there, just last time I was in America, I went to see a very dear friend of mine who has two children, and they go to the same school. And they're, they're pretty much similar in age. And uh, so that particular day that I came, the kids were not in school. And so I asked what happened. They said, well, there was a warning that somebody detected that somebody was coming in with firearms that they were going to shoot up that school. Because <laughs> that happens. 
And so, you know, the kids were stay, they stayed home that day. <laughs> so, you know, it's not something it's on the news. You can get real life experiences from these things. <laughs> So I was relieved to hear that somebody had detected what was going to happen and notified the police ahead of time. And then the police came in and cordoned off the whole school and then they closed it down and nobody went to school that day. So <laughs> this was in Chicago. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty wild society out there. It's just like very dangerous. So if, uh, that's why Prabhupada wanted us to really make, make it an emphasis to give our children the best type of education with, from Krishna consciousness. And so they don't have to, you know, be exposed to the dangers and also the wrong types of education that they get. And one of the worst things that are happening in our schools is that kids use bad language all the time. It's like very common. And then even some of the nice kids that come home, they start using it too. <laughs> and their mother's saying, getting really angry at the kids. You know? <laughs> Where'd you get that from? Well, you know, my friends say, you say, they say the same. <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, therefore, well, the emphasis is what, is what Srila Prabhupada, he wanted us to develop a society that was somewhat uh, exclusive for or inclusive, where we can and won't have to depend on whatever we need from the secular society as it becomes more and more a demoniac. And Prabhupada said that in 1972. He said the demons are only increasing and they will continue to increase. He said, but don't worry, Krishna will protect you. <laughs> he protected Devaki when she was being harassed by Kamsa. She, would, she protected Prahlad Maharaj when he was protected when he was being harassed by his father. Prabhupada said, just chant Hare Krishna and uh, you know, stay connected to Krishna consciousness and Krishna will protect you. But still, he, he, he said that this, this society is just a soul-killing society. And so he wanted more of a, a society based on being everything that we need we can find within the confounds of Krishna conscious arrangements. And that way we don't have to sacrifice. Because, you know, I, I, I go to America and people come home. They're workers. They're nice Indian families. They come and they say to me, Maharaj, you know, I try to be humble at work, but it doesn't work. <laughs> they, they consider me to be a weakling or really just uh, in, inept or in, unable to do anything if I'm... If I'm trying to practice humility. And I said, yeah, in the workplace you have to be like, you know, it's like competition. And you have to think of ways to destroy your, your you know, you're the opposition <laughs> by having better products <laughs> or doing whatever you need to do. So yeah, so we find people who are brought up in Vedic culture, they find it very difficult. Sometimes they find themselves amalgamating into that culture and they become like that. And then after a while they start to feel bad about that. I see that a lot also. So therefore Prabhupada, and he said not only for us but for the whole world. He said make these farm communities. He says as society collapses they will come. People will come to me looking, come to us, our farms, looking for some kind of shelter. And Prabhupada said, we will give them a chance to do some work. He said, first Varna, then Ashram. Engage them according to a particular Varna and then give them some occupation, take care of them, and gradually you can move them into the Ashram. But first Varna, he said. And he said, society will collapse. <laughs> he said that 50 years ago, 1973. He said, in 50 years, this whole society will be and it's falling apart already, anyway. It's, it's, it's going to hell right now. <laughs> and, uh, but Lord Chaitanya is there, and he has a plan. And Lord Chaitanya's plan is to actually bring about a revolution in Krishna consciousness. But part of it is a more simplified lifestyle, going back to nature, going back to uh, 
uh, becoming dependent on what Krishna gives in terms of material nature, food, air, Baba said, make your own cloth, build your own houses, learn herbs, and make your own medicines. And this part of the of Prabhupada's statements we don't talk about so much because it seems like it doesn't bring in much you know, money as far as our preaching is concerned. But it's the foundation by which uh, Prabhupada was a visionary. He wasn't just a, you know, a great personality. He could actually understand how society will degress and how we should progress in moving forward in our practice of Krishna consciousness by establishing a lifestyle that is more simple, simple, simple living a Krishna consciousness. Sometimes we make a joke. I was in, they call it uh, simple living, high thinking, we say, we said, they say, uh, high living and no thinking. Not no time to think, because you're too busy trying to live, <laughs> or try to keep up with the... Of course, devotees don't have to worry about that, but if you're living outside of you're working for the, for the secular society, you're going to be victimized to some degree. So anyway, we have to stay strong in our Krishna consciousness. And uh, practice is very strong sadhana. Sadhana is the foundation by which we can develop the understanding of how to live our, in, in practice Krishna consciousness effectively and progressively. That means when our sadhana is strong, we're ready for anything. <laughs> And I, I don't use that as a euphemism. I mean that when you have good rounds, he's hearing Srimad Bhagavatam every day, associated with and serving Vaishnavas, and then you're, you're equipped you know, spiritually, you're, you're protected by Krishna through the process of bhakti, and you also, your mind is clear how to execute your devotional service. You don't become bewildered by the external environment. <laughs> so it's important that we remain, remain strong in our sadhana. Okay, there's these a few things centered around cow. We could speak about cows all day because there's so much glory when it comes to uh, what a cow represents both to the human society and to the practice of spiritual life. So much. Any comments, questions on anything? Yes? There's a microphone coming. We got our speedy runner here. Okay. Hare Krishna. Um, you spoke last time about uh, mantras, how they can be useful for, um, as weaponing, because you said also, that um, the, col the society will collapse, uh, and we see it now. It is increasing a lot fast. And it's collapsing so it could be rebuilding, but it has to yeah. be build, rebuilt in the right way, not in the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If we could collapse it to build another society, that will collapse also. That's not the idea. Yeah. That collapse is to help prepare for Lord Chaitanya's movement. Otherwise, before you, you know, before you can actually do an operation, you have to do so. You, you have to you have to get the the patient ready, make sure everything is clean. The instruments are clean. The the environment's clean. The patient's clean. Chloroform purification, and you can do the operations. So Lord Chaitanya is cleaning house now. <laughs> But he's doing it in different ways to bring about his movement. But we have to re actually understand where, what is our role in helping to bring that about. Um, how do we can protect about violence from governments or from criminals in this time of destruction and... Chan Hare Krishna. <laughs> only that. <laughs> yeah. Prabhupada also said that in 1975 on a morning walk in... Uh, in Mayapur, he was with m many of the s senior devotees in, in Iskand. All the senior devotees were there on that walk. Was, 
It's a famous morning walk, April 4th, 1975. Mount Prabhupada said, it was, they labeled that particular talk the World War III talk. <laughs> and Prabhupada's talking about, you know, the wars, the collapse of the society. And he said, we have our farms. We have our new Vrindavan, we have our Vrindavan, we have our Mayapur. But then devotees were saying, well, what are we going to do when things get worse? Prabhupada says, chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> and then someone thought, well, maybe, maybe Prabhupada didn't understand the question. <laughs> and Prabhupada said, if you're ch chanting Hare Krishna, Krishna will protect you. But still, we should build these farm communities. He also emphasized that also. But chanting Hare Krishna. There is so, and then I use the word so with emphasis, many experiences that devotees have had being in a very dangerous situation. And simply by remembering Krishna, taking shelter of the holy name, the whole thing has been reversed. <laughs> so, yeah, if you're chanting Hare Krishna, seriously, I mean, not just like, you know, your mind is somewhere and your, your lips are going. You have to be connected to that sound vibration. You're in the spiritual energy. And the material energy cannot touch the spiritual energy. But you have to do it seriously, not just like in, in mechanically. Okay. Yes, uh, Nitya Seva. Um, Marja, I have two questions. Uh, one of the questions is, um, like Srila Prabhupada said that um, um, people will come and take shelter of our farms and then we have to engage them according to Varna and Ashram. Could you please a um, little bit explain about this, how? Engage them according to Varna. Yeah, well, you... Now, evaluation means to understand pretty much what is the nature of a particular individual who has come and then try to guide them according to how best they can work and give them some occupation. So, of course, you have the... In this age, people will generally require education before they can understand their position within the Vanarsham system. You know, Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, everybody sujars. Therefore, Prabhupada wanted to have these uh, uh, Vanarsham college to teach, the Brahmins would teach the other Varnas, you know, how to manage, how to fight, and how to, how to, um, you know, keep cows, how to grow agriculture. You know. And suitors, they just assist the other three. But Prabhupada wanted it first in our society. He said, first establish not only Vanarsham, but Daivi Vanarsham. It means spiritual vanashram. That means engaging in devotional service according to your particular nature. Like that. And then for people who come, then we can give them some education and then an evaluation based on the education and see how to engage them. So that was Prabhupada's explanation of that. Mm -hmm. Um, um, sometime back you mentioned in one of your classes about this, um, like how there are some <laughs> demons disguised as human beings and you said that... Uh, uh, dis <laughs> demons disguised as human <laughs> beings? <laughs> human beings is demons. And you, you, you mentioned that there was someone... I, be, you be careful where you walk these days. <laughs> Um, and you mentioned there was someone who left the body and they were not actually showing, he was some famous person. Yeah, some person in a big, very rich and powerful family. They, the person died, but they didn't want to show the body, so they kept closed casket. <laughs> so you can conjecture for there. From <laughs> I won't get into the details of that, but if you want to know more, I'll talk to you on the side. <laughs> So, yeah, and Prabhupada also, he said, you know, he, he made some statements, and it was, he said seven Rakshashas are actually controlling the world. 
And the devotees even said to him, should we preach to them? Prabhupada says, you can't, you can't approach them. <laughs> you can't approach them. They're not approachable. <laughs> so yeah, this is Kali Yuga. You can expect that this, this is the age of, you know, so many bad qualities. Bad qualities come from persons who are in the lower modes. Bhagavatam explains in the seventh canto, that when the mode of goodness is prominent, the demigods are in control. When the mode of passion is prominent, the demons are in control. And when the mode of ignorance is prominent, the yakshas and rakshasas are in control. Krishna sets up the material energy and it works accordingly. So according to collective karma of a particular society or planet, a certain class of people become prominent according to that mode that is prominent. So most people are sinful nowadays, so the lower modes are more stronger. <laughs> Is that all right? Thank you. Okay, that's introduction to lesson one. <laughs> Anything else before we end? Okay, thank you. Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Cookies Ki Jai. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.